Somebody lost your video? Okay, you're back. Okay, I'm going to get started and people will keep trickling in. But I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to all of you six women for joining me here. I know it's been a busy time. I know everyone has a lot of work, anxieties, and just general uncertainty. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time to be here. And not just that, also for agreeing to share your thoughts very honestly and candidly, which I really believe will be valuable to everyone who's listening in not just people who are organizing events and community gatherings, but even the individuals that are within those communities. I think that's something that's top of mind, not just for us, but for all of you as well. So thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners for chiming in. Honestly, we were very nervous about what a virtual disco event would be like and seeing how we can engage with people, even in this format is really encouraging. I do miss this setting and the people around me physically, but I think it's nice that we can make do with this for now. So for those of you who don't know me and who don't know Disco, I'll just tell you a little bit briefly about me. I'm Prisha, the co-founder of Disco, which I run with my brother, Michal. And Disco is a professional networking platform. We work online and offline, not at the moment though, but our goal is to bring together people for valuable, meaningful connections and help facilitate collaborations between them. I think what we're looking at is kind of tapping into this new and modern way of working, which includes a lot of collaborations between people. It touches upon social recruitment and just helping people work together in ways that go beyond a client and vendor sort of arrangement or an employer and an employee kind of arrangement. We've been hosting events for the last three years and we've hosted over 25 events now the smallest one being for 10 people and the largest one being for about 700 people. I know a lot of you here have hosted events that are for much larger groups than that. And we're hoping in the near future to scale much larger uh, circumstances permitting. But I think the goal of all of us gathering here today is to really talk about how all of us are being impacted. You know, it goes without saying that Anyone who, whose business relies on offline interactions, obviously work has come to a standstill on the offline front. We've all been hit in the same ways, you know, revenues not coming in, people not being able to meet. But I think it goes beyond that. We're trying to think about how we can move forward. So over this session, over the next hour, we're not really trying to recount everything that all of us have done over the last two months, but instead we're sort of positioning ourselves here where we are today, looking at what we've learned and the challenges that we've seen over the last couple of months and thinking about how each of us is envisioning a, a path forward going, going ahead in the next six months to two years. You know, we can talk about 10 years from now or 50 years from now, but we're not really just trying to imagine the future. We're trying to talk about what are the practical and achievable steps we all are trying to take what are the real challenges that are most urgent in front of us? Um, not just dreaming and imagining of a better future. We are making two assumptions today that's kind of underlying the entire discussion. The first one being that obviously we don't know exactly how this situation is going to pan out. We don't know exactly when we'll be able to gather again offline. We don't know the laws and the rules around how we'll be able to do that. So we aren't really going to you know, go into guesswork. But we are going to talk about um, realistically, what do you feel you can do with your existing skills and resources as well? I wanted to introduce our speakers today just so you can get an idea of the diversity in the room and why we've selected these people to speak about these topics. Um, the topics that we'll be covering include, is it feasible to move our models from offline to online? Does it make financial sense? Is it possible to do a hybrid model? Is it, is it important for us to reassess demand and how do we rethink what we're offering in light of that reassessment? You know, these are questions that it's, it's very important to us at Disco, but I know it's important to each of you and that's really why we're getting into the discussion. So our first speaker for today is Marlies Blumendahl, who's a Dutch national and she's been living here in Bombay for the last, uh, I think since 2008, right Marlies? 
I think you're muted at the moment. Yeah, I think something like that. Yeah, around 12. Twice. I, I stopped counting. <laughs> um, and Mali's runs a boutique co-working space called Ministry of New, which is absolutely stunning. It was actually featured on Forbes's list of one of the most beautiful co-working spaces in the world, which I think is a phenomenal accomplishment. Um, we have Sarah Chawla, who is a co-founder of Wild City, which is India's premier, one of India's premier online music publications. They publish content, they host workshops. And in addition to that, something that many of our speakers would probably recognize is that Wild City also co-founded the Magnetic Fields Music Festival, um, which I haven't had the chance to attend to yet, but I really hope to very soon. We're really excited to have Sana Vora as well join us, who's the founder and CEO of the Wedding Brigade. For those of you who don't know, Wedding Brigade is a one-stop shop where you can kind of tackle all of your wedding needs. There's an e-commerce element. There's an element where you can book vendors and other service providers. And more recently, I think, Sana, you were also looking at going into the offline kind of wedding planning and hosting phase as well. Yeah. Um, Sana was also featured in the coveted Forbes 30 Under 30 list recently. And I think that's one of her incredible accomplishments that we'd love to highlight. We also have Archana Walavalkar, who is quite well known for those of you who are in fashion. She's a co-founder of Style Cracker and has also been one of the leading and first, first Indian stylists in the fashion space. Um, she's worked with several, several Bollywood stars and a host of other leading magazines in the country as well. And next we have Malika Parikh, who is the exclusive owner of Physique 57 in India. For those of you who don't know, Physique 57 is a really exciting 57-minute bar-based method of working out and many, many celebrities and other influencers and just genuine people rave about it. Um, that's something that she's really passionate about in addition to preventative health care. And our final panelist is Kaveri Acharya, who's a Mumbai-based communications consultant. I've had the pleasure of working with Kaveri over the last two and a half years. And it's safe to say that she's one of the most insightful people who works in the arts, culture, and um, museum gallery space in the country. And she's a phenomenal person if you're going to talk to about the intersection of marketing and communication in that zone. So thank you, Kaveri, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Just a little bit of housekeeping rules to the audience here. We'll be taking questions right at the end. So I will, you can send them in throughout the discussion, but we'll only look at them at the end. So we're going to go right into the discussion. Uh, and the first point I really wanted to bring up is something that underpins all of our businesses, businesses that involve people being physically present and interacting with each other. You know, even for disco at our events, one of the most meaningful things was allowing people to have offhand conversations, by chance interactions, and kind of allow them to interact in a much more human way, which is tough to do online. Um, and Malis, I thought you could begin by talking to us about how that's going to impact co-working and how you're thinking about that, especially because the entire concept of co-working involves people meeting and networking offline. Uh, could you talk us through how you're thinking about if you can even move co-working online if it serves the same purpose, um, you know, if you move that sort of a business model online and how have you been navigating that? Uh, well, of course, so uh, unfortunately we had to close our space uh, indeed for uh, during the lockdown. Um, and since it came as a, you know, still a shock, uh, we had to think fast and also with the team uh, immediately like think like, okay, how, how are we going to deal with this? Um, but then, um, yeah, it is, it's difficult to, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, debate also internationally with other co-founders or founders of co-working spaces in the world, like digital co-working and people are trying it, like virtual co-working. So there are groups doing that and co-working spaces are doing that online. Uh, where you, yeah, like this, like you sit, uh, you know, you sit in a Zoom room in a way and you work together. But of course, yeah, it's not the same as, you know, you miss the serendipity. That's, I think, the main thing what co-working 
um, has uh, going for it. It's not just about sitting at a desk and you have to do fast Wi-Fi or anything. Uh, it's very much about the people you meet. It's the main thing. So, uh, you know, to really um, bring that uh, online, no, I don't, uh, I don't believe so. Um, but of course, we know this is not forever, right? So uh, in that sense for us, it's more now like focus on the current members, uh, keep them engaged and keep them, in, you know, keep in touch with them. Uh, I think that's most important at the moment and, and keep that alive. And, and I just hope we, we can open at some point again and, and we'll get that, that vibe back uh, because virtual co-working, no, that's, I don't see it. And Molly's, I mean, uh, a Ministry of New is quite different from, say, a large co-working space, right? The, the entire design of your space and the value that people get is very different from, say, a WeWork or a CoWorks. They're almost two different offerings. Do you think that this is going to sort of, the way you're thinking about how you could move parts of it online, do you think it's very different for you as compared to larger businesses in the same space? Yeah, it is. I think we we, ha we are in a winning hand here in a way because since we're smaller, um, our members know each other and there's a lot of trust in that sense. So even when we open again, you know, I think people will come back very, very soon because you have a kind of family there, right? It feels like a second home almost. So that's great that we're like smaller. And on the other hand, also, it's very spacious. So we don't have to change anything in our layout. We, we will change certain things, of course, and we'll put some extra plants here and there to you know, uh, uh, I don't know, border areas off or something or create more space in between. But uh, we're, we're lucky that we already have, have that in place. It's boutique and it's like already very spacious. Um, others, yeah, then I think it's more, our space is more like about hospitality and services. And, and I think a lot of the big ones, the big co-working spaces or business centers, they have a big issue because it's just, you know, real estate. So people are like, oh, you know, I just stop con the contract and I go somewhere else because they don't have that added value of, of like that whole community, for example, where you, you know, what you, what you need for, for small businesses. Um, and on that front, like, do you think that because if people have to move online, I think one of your USPs or your competitive advantage was in the beautiful space that you had, right? Um, not having access to that or not being able to leverage what was one of your biggest competitive advantages. Do you, how do you think you can tackle that if everything's moving online or if, you know, everyone's competing for online space? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, a lot of members do come in because it's such a pretty space, but I think since the last two years, I think our main hashtag has been not just, not just a pretty space. Um, because people do come in for it and we got a lot of press around it about design and about like the high ceilings and everything. But as soon as people uh, settle in at the ministry, they do come for the people and they, I don't know, I'm sure they still see the nice design, but it's less, less relevant at, uh, you know, at some point and you just want to get your work done and you, you want to, you know, enjoy with your friends there and, and, you know, get the best out of it uh, while working there. So yeah. then, uh, you know, we build that also like, okay, you know, this is not about the design. It should not be about the, the pretty space. Yeah. Uh, so I think we worked on that. And I think now we see the, the outcome of that as well, that people see there's more to it than that. Yeah. And actually that brings me to you, Malika. Um, you know, physique is also a space that has invested so much in making your studios really stand out. It is something that your members and your clients, they come and they look forward to, right? It's a little oasis of calm and also energy. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you think, is it feasible? Is it possible to move online? What does that mean for your offline spaces? I know you've been doing online classes and, and you know, you can talk a little bit about that too, but I'd love to know from you. Yeah, thanks, Krisha. Um, and thanks, Marlies. Actually, we, uh, I'll just take a moment. We actually had our offices at the Ministry of New for a very long time. As and well as Kaviri also. What's that? Kaviri as well. That's Kaviri as well. Yeah. So, and, you know, after a while, um, of course, the space matters and the space is important, but it, it really comes down to the interpersonal, uh, you know, interaction that, that we experience in these places. So, I think for us specifically, you know, we have been able to move it online. We've been fortunate in that 
the method itself has allowed us to sort of move from offline to online. It's taken great effort um, and uh, is definitely not as easy as, uh, as it seems. I mean, people were online so quickly, us included, but it really did take a lot of effort. And I think what happens is that it's one thing to just sort of stream your services online if you're able to. Uh, but what people are craving, especially during a time when all of us are in isolation, is the fact that they want community. And so how do you take this community that you had in the, the offline group setting and create that virtually? So one aspect uh, of what we had to do in transitioning online was definitely work to create our, uh, our community. But uh, what, what happens is that wh what I think often can, get, uh, can, can be forgotten in, in the group, in the online setting and in, in creating that virtual community is the fact that humans are actually inherently competitive beings, right? And so there's this phenomenon known as the Kohler effect, uh, which, is, uh, which explains that when you're in a group setting, uh, people in the group setting actually perform stronger than they do than 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 the weakest link or than than the weakest link would perform as an individual. So we're competitive in nature, and being in a group setting leads us to this positive competitiveness, which actually enhances performance because it motivates us. Mm -hmm. And so while we may be able to create this virtual community, um, and you know, interpersonal connection virtually, which we're all sort of getting used to, but I think we're starting to wrap our heads around. Uh, in, in a space like fitness or, or wellness, um, you know, the group environment, when you see the person next to you performing, as human beings, you are motivated to perform better. And that is very difficult uh, to create in the online setting because it's really you know, in the offline group setting that you you are able to sort of feed off of that energy and motivate yourself because nobody wants to be the weakest link, link in that group setting. So I think what's going to be important as we sort of try and bridge, you know, online and offline business and become these omni-channel businesses, if we can, um, is to really, is to A, create that sense of community, but also to find ways to motivate and enhance performance outside of that in-person group setting which I think is, uh, is really going to be a longer term goal and, and, and difficult to accomplish, um, not at, more difficult to accomplish than, than establishing the community itself. For sure. I mean, I've been reading articles, you know, um, there's all sorts of crazy things on the internet, but just about how there are companies thinking about constantly having monitoring, uh, you know, devices on employees so they can make sure that they're working for a long period of time or like, trying to figure out how to hack this competitiveness, this positive competitiveness. And I think some things just can't be hacked. You know, keeping a camera on someone is not the same as saying, we're all sitting in the office together, so we're motivated by each other's energy. It's not the same thing. And I think what you're saying about building a community is very important. You know, um, Kaveri, actually, uh, you might want to chime in in a bit. But I was, I was thinking about what you were telling me about how you're seeing a need for community and cultural spaces more than ever before now and why we need to be propping each other up. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, what's been really extraordinary during this really hard time is the kind of support that's come out to help artists sustain their practices. And uh, I'm sure that's happening in the music space as well, Sarah. Um, but yeah, and there's a lot of goodwill, um, and particularly in a sector that's, you know, in the commercial gallery space, which is, can be quite isolationist at the best of times. Um, it's wonderful to see this sense of community. Um, of course, you know, we wonderful that things like Art Night Thursday, which um, happened in Bombay, and, you know, all the galleries would be open until 9.30 in the events, and it was the perfect way to, for sort of people who are interested in art to come together and gallery hop. None of that's happening at the moment. Um, but these conversations have shifted to the online space and the, it's very much keeping in view how we can continue to create meaningful conversations and support people. Yeah, I think it's interesting because we've also, you know, take this event, for example, 
I, I already feel after two or three conversations, um, this group of six people, seven people feels a bit of affinity towards each other. But what about the, all the people who are sitting in the audience? I know there are so many people there listening who would be you know, wonderful for each of you to talk to, but we've got to think of ways to keep that community feel alive. You know, at normal disco events, we'd be able to introduce you to each other. Everyone can talk to everyone. How do you enable that sense of community online is definitely a big question for us. I don't know if anyone else um, have, wants to share any thoughts, uh, Sana, Archana, or we can move on. Uh, yeah, I think that does bring us to thinking about this hybrid model, right? So disco as well, we never actually, uh, funnily enough, we never planned to do events in the beginning. Our offline model was offhand, it happened by chance. We were always meant to be an online platform and the events complemented it. It helped us build the community, um, which we couldn't succeed in doing as easily by just posting on Instagram, you know, or like doing newsletters. It's tough to get people to feel uh, like they band together. I was wondering how, especially for both you, Sana and Archana, you know, you both of your models involve a strong online component and then there are elements that are offline. Sana, could you tell us about how you're looking at, is a hybrid model possible? and how are you thinking about what this would entail? Sure. So I think for us, you know, what we are focusing on is whether hybrid weddings are possible. But I genuinely think that it's really applicable for any kind of event across the spectrum. So when we started looking at the concept of a hybrid wedding, I think for us, the first thing to figure out was what part could be done online and what part could be done offline. And how do you make the online experience more immersive, right? Which is something... Uh, you know, you guys were talking about a little bit earlier as well, rather than just making someone feel like a spectator. And the second part was, you know, rethinking how to actually plan these events, because it's very different than planning a traditional offline event in a pre-pandemic world. And so for us right now in the wedding space, for example, weddings of up to 50 people are allowed, uh, which are much smaller than the typical Indian wedding. And what that means is that, you know, the bride, the groom, close family and friends are going to be attending these weddings a lot of which are going to be happening at home. But there's still going to be a need to sort of involve or broadcast your slightly larger family, your slightly, you know, maybe not your best friends, but people who you would want to share the day with you. And so we do think that especially while these restrictions are there, there is going to be a very, very strong element of live streaming weddings while they are happening in person. So we do, we're already seeing requests like that come in and we do think that's going to be applicable to other events as well, right? You have the key stakeholders there, but how do you share it with the larger group of people? And the challenge there is, you know, how do you make sure the people who are watching also feel involved? And some ideas that we're thinking about is that, say, if someone's having a wedding for 30 people in their house, but they have, um, you know, 30 other people from the city they live in who are tuning in, why not send, have the caterer deliver food to all of their houses as well so they can also eat it and enjoy it and feel a little bit more a part of the event or rather than sort of doing a performance in the house that it's happening why not play an interactive game about the couple during the sangeet to make people feel more involved so figuring out how to make the online side of this hybrid model just feel a little bit more part of it and the second part which is i think taking up more of our time actually is rethinking how these events are going to get planned so now, because of obviously the health risks, mobility risks, uh, just a lack of selection due to so many businesses being shut down, people are much less likely to roam around the small markets the way they did before or go to small offices and meet with vendors and uh, you know figure out what products they want to be part of their wedding. So we're moving a really large part of that process online. We already have an e-commerce store where people buy wedding fashion, jewelry and gifts, but we're trying to bring a lot of the smaller aspects of planning online as well, like puja supplies or ordering you know, flowers to decorate your home. And so uh, looking at the planning part and how to make that easier for people, that's also a big part of you know, figuring out the hybrid model. And do you feel like this is something that you would be able to do with, obviously resources are a question, right? If anyways, um, business has stopped for a while, you have even less liquidity to say, build out additional new services, new models. Do you think what you're looking at is feasible and achievable within your reach at the moment? I think so, because I think in terms of sort of the, 
you know, physical or vendor connections. Most people who are involved in events already know the caterers, they know the vendors. In our case, we know the photographers, the makeup artists, etc. And a lot of the tech tools that you need to do this can be outsourced, right? Like YouTube has a great live streaming service. It's not necessarily something you need to build yourself. There are aspects of it and elements of it that will require some effort, but our approach has already built, has always been that, you know, don't rebuild the wheel if you don't need to. If there's a solution, use it and let's focus our efforts on what other people can't build or can't do. For sure. No, I mean, we've been thinking about that as well. You know, we don't have uh, tools like this, like hosting a Zoom virtual event or kind of all these online events tools that wasn't part of the plan to build it out so much in depth. And we're also looking at which elements can we outsource or just, you know, use plugins for, for example, and which ones are really critical for us to build out. Um, and that's a question definitely I thought Archana would also be able to add to, because again, similar to the wedding brigade, you have a large online portal. You've already built a digital platform. How are you thinking about, well, obviously now we're talking about the new normal, whatever that is, if it, if it does come, we're talking about being even more digitally friendly. How are you thinking about uh, how does Style Cracker go one or two steps further digitally? How, are you thinking of more, a more hybrid model? If you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Krisha, actually, for having us and bringing us all together like this. You know, this has been, uh, it's been a tough time, but it's nice to just hear stories from all you lovely ladies and, you know, just understand and like, um, and I guess just understand that we're all in this together. And um, it's nice to have kind of a sounding board like this. Um, honestly, for me, it's been, you know, instead of just focusing on this uncertain constantly, because that's kind of been giving me anxiety, like, you know, how can we move past this? You know, what are those questions that we need to ask ourselves, given the situation of making the shift from uh, online, uh, offline to online? You know, are we really uh, being open minded about it? For instance, you know, are we really willing to let go of what was, you know, as you mentioned, that sort of old order of things? And um, are also are we willing to break that habit, that primal habit as human beings, you know, which actually in this situation is kind of limiting, uh, you know, because we, I, I genuinely believe that we're at the cusp of like a digital revolution and we all need to be building businesses that are tech first. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really important we kind of integrate that into our businesses from the beginning. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of, you know, young entrepreneurs listening in. So I think also the idea, I guess, to reevaluate the terms what big or scale or speed really mean to us anymore? You know, how, how, how big is big? Or, you know, how, how quickly do you, do you want to scale? And, and what is that scale really? I mean, even from a human greed kind of perspective, I think everyone is just rethinking this, um, you know, this at this given uh, stage. But however, having said that, it is a huge and amazing opportunity to, you know, really create and innovate. And especially for someone like me who, is is creative i think um given this chance of kind of blue sky gazing you know let's just kind of take that high risk because if not now then when so um so there's also that great opportunity at the same time um but i think what's most important is to make that shift um is the customer experience you know building something that i guess is so unique and um, so disruptive that your customer kind of gets hooked on to that, that new model that you're trying to create for them, you know, but it has to be super personal at the same time, you know, so probably having a front end that's really captive, that's got a strong human connect, but of course backed with like an intelligent algorithm on the back end, you know, so I, I feel like it's all about, sorry, Kaveri, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to ask you how you would message this though, um, particularly now when I think everybody's trying to be sensitive, um, you know, and also reassure customers um, about safety. Um, and it's sort of, I think it's all about um, the soft touch at the moment, right? right. Um, so you do want people to buy stuff, but it's also how do you package that message? Right. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think it all comes down to that customer experience that I'm, I guess, trying to talk about, you know, like building those better tools of communication. For example, 
I think it's an important time to build deeper relationships with your customer, like literally picking up the phone and directly calling up your customer, you know, from in the leadership triangle, I feel from top down from your senior management to the entire team, like this is the time to really connect with your, um, you know, these users who've been engaging with you this entire time, but you've never kind of given them that personal attention. So, um, so sure, it may sound like, how, how do I call every single user? You know, we've got several thousands of users, but I think that's the time where you kind of um, want to make those creative, take those creative calls and make and expand the team and, you know, their abilities to kind of do something like that. That's a, a lot more personal where you tell kind of the customer that I hear you, I see you, you know, I mean, we're here, we, we've not gone anywhere. Um, and then, you know, kind of think of new engaging ways of just, communicating with them. Um, I also, I'm sorry, Archana, I just wanted to add to that. I think given, um, you know, the circumstances, we're seeing people respond a lot better to when they feel like brands are thinking about them or talking to them. I think even though you might be able to reach a lot more people online, you're, I think we will see people, and this is a personal opinion, of course, but I think we will see people willing to pay a premium for more personal attention and personalized service. So I think more than ever, people want to, they want to know that you understand where they're coming from. And if you're tailoring something to them, I think we will shift to a point where people are willing to pay that higher price and they're willing to have loyalty to brands that show that they're hearing them and they're thinking of them. Absolutely, right. And I think that kind of creates that long term value with your customers, right. And as you mentioned, it does have a larger impact because um, I, I know Sana earlier mentioned as well that, you know, because we're going online, then we can make a bigger impact across different demographics at the same time. You know, you mentioned Sana that um, uh, taking weddings online, for instance, so sure, you'll have your uh, intimate group of 50 present with you. But then Maybe I would have had a wedding just with 100, 150, 200, 300 people, but now I can have like possibly an 800 people wedding, you know, <laughs> just like involve everyone, like get them all in. So I think that's the kind of aspect I'm getting at that. Um, sure, it's time to focus back on your core business, bring everything back to your product and really, really stay, stay true to what your product is. So all the communication Kaveri, what you were asking earlier as well, needs to be about that. But at the same time, it is about bringing that emotional connect back, at least with fashion, you know, my industry, fashion is emotional. I mean, it, it, it's meant to inspire and like, and bring joy. I mean, sure, it's not life or death, but it's important to many. And I think when you kind of hold on to that pulse and, you know, like really take that forward and, and speak to your customer directly, uh, you, you will sort of build that customer intimacy, you know, that we're all sort of craving and everyone spoke about community so far. It's Sorry. interesting you say that, Archana. Uh, I really like that you said that, that it's very personal, that people feel very personally connected to it. And I think everyone here from art to music to weddings to fitness and their personal health to their work, Mali's, people feel very emotionally connected to each of these areas, which is probably why they turn up offline for it, right? So I think that is something that we collectively can figure out how to leverage and, and you know, use it to, to keep serving people by giving them a little bit online and still giving them something offline, even if it's in a different format. Absolutely, um, because, you know, this, this is the kind of community that you've built that is committed to you. And if you're going to have a strong brand voice that resonates with them, they will connect to it and they will stay on, you know? So, yeah, I mean, the situation is kind of bittersweet, but, um, but as you all said, you know, I mean, various parts of India, they're opening up, like we see store openings in Delhi and in Chennai and, you know, with FTCI just uh, announcing that they're going to move uh, to a digital fashion week and internationally, so many design houses saying that, you know, they're all going to have digital showrooms now. So I think, it's, it's really a great opportunity. I truly believe this is kind of an exciting time, but of course it's scary. And, but, but I want to be hopeful about it. I think on that note, I'm going to bring up uh, the slightly less exciting and positive side of this that's on all of our minds. I think um, the most important question really, which we all have to answer as business owners, is does this make financial sense? What are the financial implications? You know, um, in any case, I think with offline, margins have always been thin, rents have been high. 
the the industry in itself was tough so i think what we want to really think about is what what model makes financial sense what are the biggest financial concerns that we can't just like slide over i think it's quite demoralizing when you think you're the only one who's having you know financial challenges when everyone else is putting on a brave face but i think what's come through when i've spoken to each of you individually as well is that that question is top of mind for everyone and i'm sure for the audience here as well so sara actually could you talk to us a little bit about um the financial impact on the live music space and just music in general you know how is it impacting individual artists everyone else all the freelancers and the independent professionals who come together in the music industry i mean it's had a mammoth effect i mean it's kind of everyone has had to complete like like everything you know we've all had to completely rethink the way we're going to earn money in the next one year at least um and i think that um there's a lot of experimentation happening um in terms of like the digital space and i think you know there's this kind of like um toy between like am i going to you know am i going to try and be the first to market with a new idea and therefore kind of dominate um that kind of uh space financially or am i going to be like the first to innovate and present something completely new but will people love it or hate it and so i think um i think we're all learning like you know from you know personally we we're, we're trying to keep as as lean as possible so that we can be as resilient as possible and you know we're really kind of looking inward and um looking at the various skill sets that we have beyond just our core offering and figuring out how we can leverage those um and i think you know we've kind of very much got to the mentality of like business in year 1 or year 2 where you're just like constantly hustling you're constantly like thinking of new ideas thinking of new ways to um uh like thinking of new ways to present things thinking of new ways to kind of generate revenue um what's been really nice in the music industry is there has been i think um in the very mentioned earlier there has been like a lot of um consciousness about um artists and music professionals using their platforms to raise awareness and generate money um for or social causes and that's something that's really inspiring and i hope becomes a lasting legacy of what is happening right now that you know there is more of an alignment with the social sector and the arts as as a permanent as a permanent move but i think that um i think i think i would access my advice is to exercise caution because you know once you 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 also it's very difficult to kind of like turn back the time i think it's really important to experiment and to kind of present new things but i also think you know there's there's only like so much that you can do without um before you can you know like there's only so much you can present for free before you start asking people to pay for it um whether that's as a donation or whether that's as like a small fee um i think you know what we've been uh doing is just like um looking inward really and also asking like um our community through the events that we're doing like what what do they need from us like we were really um uh we really just actually took the first couple of weeks to just watch and see what everyone else is doing how it, how it's playing out how are people responding like we just you know i think every evening it's the same for everyone right if you go on instagram there's like 100 people that are streaming live and so it's like and it's how to how it's really you know so how do you how do you present something that is um you know has intention and and meaning and is and it's um reacting to what people need um you know we're not musicians we're a platform but we can kind of galvanize um the community and kind of present things that other people might need so i don't know if that's answered your question but um, I, i wanted to ask you something more actually and this is something that that applies to everyone but do you think that the the financial burden ends up falling on a few people specifically you know those who are at the lowest end of the rung in terms of priorities of who gets paid or those who are anyways getting squeezed to a point which was which was problematic before covid you know are we how do you think with more stuff being online with more people offering events online free gigs online with streaming platforms you know dominating the share of of revenue how do you think that how do you navigate that really going forward if we're moving even further digital 
I mean, that's really, really tricky. I mean, you know, you think about in nightlife, all the all the people working behind the bars, all the security, all the, you know, um, the the service level staff who really are kind of the vital, you know, um, crucial to making the, the events industry work. And honestly, like, uh, there's no answer. You know, you just hope that they're, um, you hope that there are like, uh, I, I honestly don't know. Like, I think it's <laughs> it's really, really tricky. I think I think what's happened is um, well, I can speak personally as well. You know, like I think it's very easy to withdraw into our bubbles, and we just kind of like are, are firefighting the things that are immediately around us. And every now and then, we try and kind of support worthy causes and try and and see how we can align. But I think you know, it's it. There are so many people that are like utterly devastated by this, and you know, I just feel grateful every day to be in a position of privilege. But yeah, it, it's it's. I think it's horrendous for so many people right now and I think um, Malika that's something that you brought up as well you know where you were talking about increased demand for online fitness classes but the burden falling on the trainers or you know on the professionals can you talk more generally about how you know the financial impact or if it makes financial sense for something like physique 57 uh, going forward to continue doing a lot of it online yeah, actually, yes, I can. Thanks, uh, Krisha. So I think, look, I think in our situation, what was really interesting is that fitness went from being an ancillary sort of recreational activity to front and center uh, when this happened, because all of a sudden it was tied into everything that was happening, that is happening to the world currently. So exercise, wellness, health, all of it is now top of mind for so many people. And what also happened uh, as everybody went online is that everybody became a qualified fitness trainer in some way. And so we were sort of dealing with the fact that we have these incredibly well-trained, highly credentialed, highly qualified professionals who've been trained globally um, and have a lifetime of fitness experience uh, because of their backgrounds uh, who were delivering this service offline, who had to then compete with you know, people who were doing it online and who were doing it for free. And so I think that in the long run, uh, what, we've sort of, what we've sort of been able to navigate through is we had to be sensitive in the beginning. So let me, st sorry, let me back up to, to what happened immediately. So we had to sort of be sensitive to the economic situation and do our bit with complementary classes and, and sort of, you know, offer that because that was really the need of the hour. Uh, but I think that what people will find, at least in the fitness and the wellness space, is that these professionals are delivering something that you can reap the benefits for throughout your life. Um, and it's really sort of, if people are going to start viewing it as an investment in themselves. And when they start doing that, they will really be looking for those professionals that are highly credentialed, highly qualified, highly skilled, highly trained. And it's not going to come down to just what is, you know, the, the least expensive uh, modality for me to sort of pursue online. And so I think that what we've decided as, you know, in the long term is it absolutely makes sense to offer uh, a stream, you know, as offer a streaming service and offer an online component uh, and turn this into an omni-channel business. I mean, it begs the question, you know, sort of why, why didn't we really even do it sooner? Um, but, you know, I'm sure all of us are asking, uh, asking ourselves that. And so this situation presented itself. We were able to come online very quickly um, and do what we had to do in the short term. But I think the way we view it is, is, uh, is as an additional revenue stream moving forward. Uh, so definitely plan to keep it omni-channel, plan to keep the offline component. Uh, but I think, you know, what what we wanted to sort of avoid is because of we because we had these highly highly trained uh, experts that were sort of delivering this this service uh we really didn't want them to feel the hit yeah we didn't want them to have to compromise in their pay so we made you know the active decision as a business to make sure that we maintained uh what what they were earning because 
arguably what they had to do by translating all of their energy online was actually more difficult. The effort required to not only motivate themselves in the current environment, but then to motivate you know, a class full of virtual customers uh, and, and sort of motivate them to not only just follow along and listen to what they were saying, but to exercise and to do it well. That took more energy and more effort than I think you know, uh, they, they ever experienced in the offline setting. And so we really felt that it was important to match that and make sure that that was acknowledged and make sure that, um, and, and, and make sure that they felt appreciated. And so the business uh, could not rely on cutting costs and therefore the business, what we've been able to do and what we sort of have turned our, our focus towards is really our reach. And so now, given the fact that we're not going to make our trainers compromise because we can't, because they're delivering the essential uh, you know, uh, uh, value. value exactly to the, to the client. Uh, we, we really need to turn to our reach and the fact that we sort of turned from physique 57 Mumbai to physique 57 India overnight. And, uh, and I think that that, you know, hopefully we hope fingers crossed that will pay off because there are so many people that want credible forms of health, wellness, you know, fitness, um, in other parts of the country. Now they don't have to travel to our studio to get that. So. And I, I really appreciate that, Malika. I think that's something so important that each of us as community you know, leaders or people who facilitate these communities, it is our responsibility to stick up for those who could end up being on the losing end. It's tough. It's tough for us as well. But um, I, I really think that is a critical thing that we need to do. Sana, I think you had something to say. So I was going to give an example from an industry where, you know, demand has fallen uh, during the virus because obviously, you know, uh, those are pretty different experiences. For us, when the virus hit, no one was really looking to get married. A lot of weddings were getting postponed. Um, and so the financial pressure was also really large. And the way that we started thinking about it was that coming to terms with, yes, events are going to be smaller, right? What any wedding professional is going to own on an event for 500 people versus 50 people is very different. But the way we start thinking about it is, okay, earlier if we were doing two out of the 10 things required for the weddings, how can we now do six out of those 10 things? So that we're earning like a larger part of the pie, even though the pie is smaller. And I think that's something that would work for, you know, any industry that is hit is what are the services that are maybe a step above you or a step after you or parallel to you that you can get involved in. Uh, to sort of maximize earnings during this time. Yeah, I think it's about depth, not just, you know, offering lots of services, but even seeing where you can do something deeper. I know at Disco, we've seen how much, it was always like tough for us because we feel like people love getting personalized health and personalized service, but we stayed away from that because how many people can you do that for? Whereas yeah. now we're seeing if we pick 10 people and we do it for those 10 people, that could be actually a lot more valuable for us as well. So we are exploring a similar thing that, as to what you said, Sana. Um, Mali's, I actually wanted to, to get your opinion because I think with co-working, of course, it's the costs are quite clear, right? You have the space and then you have membership fees. Um, you have to continue paying for the space, I'm assuming, whereas membership fees is complicated if the people aren't getting access to the physical space. And you know, that sort of when I heard that about universities in, in, in all parts of the world where they're considering asking students to pay almost the full amount without having access to the space, how do the students feel about that? So I think from a financial sense, I just wanted to know what are the questions or the challenges that you're facing? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, that's, that it has been very painful. <laughs> um, but we do, uh, we, we still have members who keep on paying, which is great. And, uh, and they do understand that we are also like, you know, a small, small team and a small company. So um, they, they keep supporting us and we have a rollover system anyway. So they, if, if people continue paying their membership, they can use those days uh, later uh, as soon as we open again. Nice. So that's, that's not, uh, yeah. Okay. For them, I don't think uh, it's uh, it's the main uh, the main issue. But yeah, for us, of course, we don't have any income from uh, I don't know other other things as well. Yeah, that's uh, it has an impact for sure. Um, I wanted to add like the events. Of course, um, we continue to have to have events um, online, uh, just via Instagram or uh, Zoom as well. 
um, but of course the the costs are also lower right as soon as you 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 have your your events digital then there's hardly any cost involved you know time yes and of course you have to organize everything and you you're, of course your your team is still there but uh, since the since the cost is low you can also um, I mean, it depends also on the goal of your events, I think. Um, but for us, the goal of an event is mostly, you know, it's not so much about the tickets we sell. It's more like, you know, the engagement or it can be brand building yeah. or, you know, more for yeah. your marketing or to get attention from the press, for example. Um, there's so many different goals an event can have. Mm -hmm. So we just figured out very, very soon already in March, like, oh, you know, we don't have to entertain here or anything. Or we don't have to, you know, we're not going to make money on this, but we just continue doing these events to engage and to, like, you know, help, especially help the, the, the other entrepreneurs and the, yeah. the smaller businesses, as long as we continue doing that. And um, it has so much value and it's more than the long term thinking also. Uh, it makes so much sense. Yeah. And I agree also with you, like, you know, even if it's smaller, maybe smaller. Uh, amount of people you reach uh, but if the quality is good then you know uh, the effects the effects will last longer no for sure and i mean this this naturally flows into our, our last kind of segment of the discussion which is how do we reassess demand and reevaluate our offerings and this is what sana you just spoke about malika you just mentioned as well um but just thinking about paying close attention to what your users or your customers or your community really want. Obviously, we're seeing a shift in what people see as essential, what they see as things they do for fun, but like paying close attention to that and then rethinking your offerings, I think is probably the most important takeaway from this entire discussion. Kaveri, could you tell us a little bit more about the new ways in which people are collaborating, the way they're pivoting their offerings as well? Um, I know you mentioned a couple of really interesting examples to me and I thought you could share it with the group. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, of course, um, art like music and you know, weddings and fitness, uh, fashion, um, it's very much about that in-person experience, right? So I think when this happened, there was a lot of debate about how effective this shift to the, di to the digital space would be. Because um, I think, you know, anybody who loves art finds for that aha moment. You know, that in that sort of when the hair on your back stands up when you see something really compelling. Um, and of course, it's not going to be the same. So I think, you know, once we reconcile with that, we can move forward. Um, having said that, um, it's been really interesting to see the agility with which a lot of commercial art spaces have been able to make quite an elegant leap into the digital space through viewing rooms. And the tech has really been built up quite wonderfully around that. Um, I was earlier today, I was speaking to the sales director at Tark, which is a gallery in Bombay. Um, it's a relatively young gallery and they focus on um, sort of, you know, more affordable art. So not your high price blue chip gallery kind of stuff. Um, and I was asking her if, how effective these rooms have been. And turns out they have converted to sales. Um, of course, it you know, requires a soft touch at the moment. You don't chase for payments like you usually would. Um, but having said that, you, know, you reach out to somebody who might be kind of iffy about a sale at the moment and gently say that, look, you know, it is a good time to buy art because you're supporting the artist. And that really compels people to feel invested in the artist's journey and adds another layer of humanity to that entire interaction. So um, that, you know, who would have thought that people would, it would be just, you know, you'd be buying art um, through your screen, but that is happening. Um, and uh, they're also sort of in the museum space, um, particularly abroad, I think India still needs to catch up to this. Um, they're using the wonderful archival material that already exists, which is quite a clever way to do it. You know, they're sharing their big blockbuster exhibitions. I think it's the BNA or the British Museum that had an exhibition of their seminal um, Pompeii exhibition. Um, so, yeah, and I think that's a clever way to do it. Um, and you can continue to then engage young writers, content creators, you know, so that 
ecosystem continues. Um, and in terms of kind of monetizing, this could be a, a compelling case to, um, you know, like the same way we we'll pay a nominal amount when we go to a museum, do that for online viewing rooms, you know, and then so that keep the money circulating in the economy and you won't have to lay off people. Um, and in the Indian context, I think this is a great time for people to rethink in terms of collaborations um, across museums, you know, um, there's so much red tape around museums and culture in India. It's ridiculous. This would be a great time for directors to come together and, you know, push for stronger um, policy to promote culture, um, use each other's resources. You know, it's expensive to um, develop tech, hire people, so pool resources together. Um, and the creative ways to do it. Um, and, you know, hopefully the right people will listen to these ideas and will be able to make some thing that's really meaningful. And I think, you know, when we come out of this, um, this is going to be the collective wealth that we have, right? It's going to be the artists who we've seen them through it and they've seen us through this, through their wonderful work. Um, and yeah, so I think that's, that I, I do feel quite positive about the culture space. Sorry, I think that's very true. Um, I, in fact, I think the reason we should be having more dialogues like this and being honest about the challenges we're facing is because maybe someone else in the room has already tried that. It's not worked out. They've got their learnings. They can just tell you what they are and you don't have to go through that entire process. And I very, very much believe that we are seeing people wanting to share information, maybe from a selfish perspective, maybe just from a, I want to know what you know perspective, but it doesn't really matter what the reason is. I think learning from others is trials, errors, failures is definitely a way we can as a community leapfrog, you know, forward, uh, hopefully. Um, I quickly just wanted to bring in Sarah as well. I know Sarah, you mentioned how Wild City is looking at being reactive and proactive. And I thought that was really interesting in terms of reassessing what your audience or your community really wants and needs. Can you talk to us about how you've been interestingly shifting what you do by understanding their needs and desires? Um, well, I'm a big fan of questionnaires. I love asking people what they think all the time and I like it. Um, I love using SurveyMonkey. Um, and um, so we, our kind of like first digital offering, I guess, was um, kind of like a multi, a multi project where we kind of uh, had lots and lots of conversations with people and everything from like artists to music professionals and audiences. And we came up with a program that kind of combined one on one mentoring, um, closed group workshops and um, uh, conversations and performances and the idea we closed chapter one a couple of weeks ago and um, the idea was that you know you get through this you get kind of like the most amazing access to some of the best producers and music makers in in the country and get like the one-on-one -on -one feedback with them on your on on your music and then with the um, workshops they were kind of uh, I guess like crowdsourced so the subjects were based on you know what we got the most um, feedback on what people want like what skills do people want what conversations do people want to listen to and that went really well and um, we have yeah we got approached by an amazing um, I don't think we've announced it yet we got approached by an amazing ally who is um, supporting us a little bit um, with the next edition and we've made it in a way that it's kind of modular so like um, you know, we're using it as a way to, you know, all the um, audience participation is through donations. And then, you know, we're hoping to partner with um, different organizations who can help us pay the artists that give their time. So we're trying to, but we're trying to make it as like adaptable and reactive as possible. And, you know, we're constantly asking people for their feedback. So like, how did that session go? Like both for the practitioners and for the audience so that we're constantly refining and remodeling and reworking and and, const and trying to be as relevant and reactive as possible. And and I think it's the same way, you know, we're, we're, we're approaching our, our business as well like on a month by month month basis we're constantly reassessing how the team is working together like what kind of output we're creating and, and we're constantly you know 
in touch with our partners um, across the board. And I think, you know, having your ear to the ground at this time is the most important thing. Like really like, like speaking, like whether it's speaking to your clients or your, or your peers or whatever, just like keeping that dialogue going at this point is the most important thing. And, 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 also being open to change, you know, like changing yourself, like you have, you know, we've had to do a lot of ego stripping and let go of a lot of things. And that's really important. And, you know, like there are things, things that I probably haven't done since like, you know, for like eight years that I'm now back to doing again, because, you know, that's like, I, you know, that's if we want to be here in a year's time, like we've got to kind of, you know, we, we look at our own roles as well. So, um, but I think it's it's been really it's like been really wonderful to kind of have that um, connect with people and and because it also you know like we are all in the same boat we are all um, you know on this roller coaster together and you know some days people are doing okay and 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 a lot of days people are not doing okay so I think it's also really important to just ask people how they're doing and also be honest with how you're doing. I think that's the other, you know, the other evil of social media. And now everyone is online is that everyone is like showing pictures of their banana bread and their perfect like desk space and whatever. And people are not so willing to share like when everything is just like falling apart and going wrong, which it is, you know, everyone has those days. So yeah, I think, um, honesty is really important and, um, you know, just like authenticity as always, like with with your brand, with what you're doing, with your voice is more important now than ever, because that ultimately is what always kind of shines through. Um, no, I think and just sort of, sorry, Krish, I don't mean to cut you off. Just to add to that, I just want to share two wonderful examples um, from the media space. You know, like, I don't think ideas need to necessarily be complicated. But Verve did this wonderful series inviting people to take a picture of the sky. And for me, it was just, it's such a idea. But, you know, just looking at that every morning was so uplifting. And to, you know, it's just your perspective from your window outside. So, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I think there's been such an interesting thread that's gone along in, in what everyone has shared. Um, before I open it up to, we've got a bunch of questions actually that have come in, but before I open up to questions, I just kind of wanted to gather a few thoughts. Um, it sounds like everyone's excited about the opening up of new demand, you know, of opening up, of widening reach, of being able to reach places that we couldn't before. I think that's definitely a big positive. Um, even for us at this event, uh, we have people who are tuning in from other countries, other cities. It is phenomenal. So I think that is one huge silver lining that we can look to. I think another point that seems to have come up is focusing in on your core offerings and maybe diving deeper, you know, going more personal with, with your service and kind of seeing how you can support your audience or your customers even more. And even going back to things that say, like Sarah said, you didn't think that you'd be doing, but if that's something new that people want, go back to it and repackage it and think about how you can offer them that. I think it's safe to say that all of us agree that there will be, there will still be a strong element of offline just complemented by online. So whether it's a hybrid model or an omni-channel model like Malika, you mentioned, um, I think we very much see both going forward. It's not that one is going to disappear entirely or be eaten up by um, virtual robots or anything like that. Um, and the idea of community, you know, really thinking about what community means to each one of us and to the people in that community, not seeing them as followers or likes on social media, but really engaging with them, talking to them, even if it is just 50 out of your 50,000, you know, actually trying to listen to the people in your community. Um, and honestly, I think those are great takeaways. We're not, we're not trying to be, uh, you know, underestimate the, the huge number of challenges that this does present. But I do think that from everything that everyone has shared here, quite honestly, these are the silver linings. Is there anything anyone wants to add before I bring in group, the audience questions? I think it's also important for us to remember um, the value of supporting people right now. So, you know, pay for that music 
support your favorite artist buy a pair of shoes even though you don't have anywhere to go right now because you know i mean say that holiday money that you'd saved up use it now because that's we need to support each other no i think that's so nice it's it's so true you know we've had so many people reach out looking to support each other i mean we're launching um and i spoken to mali's about this we were talking about different mentoring programs and things that we could do i know sara you already doing that but people are looking at supporting the people who whose work they value so i think that is something that as people who bring communities together we should be able to facilitate uh and even with disco on our online platform that is what we are trying to create you know this conversation shouldn't end here we do want you and the audience to be able to help each other going forward malika did you want to say something or did i miss that thanks yeah uh that was that was a good read thank you uh no i just wanted to add one thing i think you know and this is really really to the panelists and to you um i think that right now what we're seeing because everything is going online or so much is going online is that um it, people are at home and they're wanting more but they're doing less for it uh they don't have to leave their house they don't have to make a trip they don't have to get in the car and travel they they don't even have to spend as much money mm -hmm. but they actually want more and i think um while it's important definitely to sort of you know ask the questions to the clients and pay attention to the need of the hour um i think it's also really important to stay true to your brand and to stay true to who you are and not to try to be all things to all people because at the end of the day this dust will settle and that won't be memorable and what the brands that will stand out and the brands that will be memorable are the brands that really uh stand for a very specific or you know or a few very specific themes mm -hmm. and so while i think it's incredibly incredibly imperative for us to listen to our our clients and our new clients i think it's also important that we stay as you said authentic to who we who we you know sought out to be in the first place absolutely yeah yeah not just diluting your brand and kind of doing something because everybody else is doing it if it right. wasn't what you started with and it's exhausting we'll get exhausted and we won't be able to do it anyway <laughs> so. i think that is how a lot of us felt when this started you know when everyone felt like we all have to do online events and it was like oh my god i can't um i know that's how the whole disco team felt sara yeah i'm we had an i had an interesting um event the other day uh or last week actually about um imposter syndrome and anxiety and one of the interesting things i took away from that which i wanted to share was that especially as um entrepreneurs and especially now you know we are in in our own kind of little bubbles i think it's important more than ever that we do create a space for ourselves because i'm very guilty of my complete everything you know every second of the day being about work and if i'm not working i feel guilty about not working and um and it's really it's a really weird feeling but you are only going to perpetuate that cycle unless you take a step back from it and try and do things that kind of feed yourself that aren't related to your work i think especially now in these times where we do feel more frantic that you know the financial burden is there and we're really unsure and uncertain the kind of the natural instinct is to just work more um even if you're not <laughs> necessarily being productive you're just like looking at your screen and so i think that was something i thought was a really interesting takeaway is is to make sure you make space for things that um create your identity that aren't to do with your work and i think that's really important because then you'll be able to be much fresher about your work and you're not feeding that kind of anxiety beast definitely i think that's a great point um i can't agree with it more i'm going to take questions now because we have about uh five or six and we have about 20 minutes left so the first one to no specific person uh what is the scope for individuals that lost their jobs due to the corona virus impact like the people who work behind the scene whether it's production teams during live events or during the online phase i think that the rest of the question mentions how much time it'll take for live events to bounce back but i don't know if we anyone has a specific answer to that but does anyone want to talk about what's the scope for those who've lost their jobs um you know within your respective communities how do you suggest they navigate this 
I mean, one way, I guess, is to look at yourself now as a freelancer. And um, I was reading a really interesting article on Reddit that someone wrote about the best way to kind of organize and manage yourself as a freelancer and to kind of look at the skills that you have and, and really kind of um, reevaluate, reevaluate that. I mean, it's really, really hard. Like, what can you do right now? Like, what are the services that you can offer from, from wherever you are right now? I think we're all having to kind of um, pivot and adapt a lot. So I think, and I think it's, it's if you have got time, um, learn a new skill if like you have the capacity to do that like whether it's and, and something you know if I, I thought about this had a I was like maybe I could learn how to do Photoshop properly or like how to make websites or like how to do coding or something but I, I definitely don't have the time with a baby and a dog and trying to save the business but um, yeah I, that's my advice like think of yourself as a freelancer if you've got the space learn new skills like read up about it um yeah and and think of think of this like kind of don't think of it about when is this going to kind of when are events going to happen again and when am i going to be able to work like what can you do kind of now and i think um as as we help a lot of people find jobs one big thing that i'd like to say here is that don't hide or shy away from the bitter truth if you know that what you'd love to do is not very much in demand right now, or it doesn't pay very much at the moment, maybe take one safe option and then do what you want to do out of fashion on the side. Just figure out ways to play it safe as well. I think looking for stability during a time that's so uncertain is also important. I would say if possible, if you have, if you were considering a career shift at the moment, maybe just keep what you have while exploring and talking to more people. So that would just be my advice to anyone who's saying how to make a shift at the moment. If you've lost your job, then see if you can find something that you know you can do, but maybe you wouldn't want to do forever and do it temporarily at least. Um, my next question, the next question is from Jason. And Jason Menzies, he says a very special mention to Marlies and Archana both of whom he knows, I think. And he's asking a question to Archana, Malis, and Sana. So any of you could answer it. What are the creative communication hacks that you've used to engage your audience right now? Sure, so maybe I can start. Uh, the first thing I think we realized was that our audience was not just like, slightly impacted by Corona, a lot of them were distraught because they were planning weddings in March, April, May. They put in so much time, money, effort, and suddenly it's canceled. And so our most important sort of reaction in the beginning was bringing them information that was genuinely relevant. You're telling them how to renegotiate contracts, telling them what parts of the planning process they could do now, what they could do later. So I think giving them that relevant information in a timely manner was really important. And I think the second thing that we're doing is that clearly everyone is generating a lot of content right now, right? Because there's really not much room. I mean, there's not much ability to do anything else. Is that we're making sure that whatever content we do generate, there is an extra layer on it that is the wedding brigades. You know, so with a lot of like wedding websites, we post a lot of photographers' photos. But rather than just posting a photo and saying, oh, what a pretty bride, it's also about, hey, by the way, the lehenga this bride is wearing, you can actually get that through an online consultation with the designer. So you can start doing the design process now. You know, adding an extra layer to differentiate our content. Nice. Yeah. And I'd just like to add to that uh, as well. Hi, Jason. It's so nice to see you here. Um, so I think for us, it's been going back to our core business uh, with Sarkracker being styling. So, you know, styling kind of has an inbuilt um, recycle and upcycle angle to it. So kind of bringing that to the forefront that, you know, you don't really need to keep buying more, but you can reuse the stuff you already have in like innovative ways. So I think changing the communication to a, a, a lot more non-transactional kind of way, you know, like not making it only about sales, sales, sales and buy, 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 because I mean, that's really, as Kaveri also said, you know, I mean, it's not really the time to be talking about that right now. And shockingly enough, um, actually surprisingly, our customers have been really understanding and they, they've been great. So don't underestimate the customer as well because they're smart, they're intelligent, they know what's going on and, and they're here to kind of help you and support you through this period as well. So it's actually been great. 
Alice, is there anything you want to add to this or? Um, in this sense, we haven't changed so much in our communication. I think um, we always try to be pretty transparent and straightforward and very personal. And uh, yeah, we haven't changed that so much. So no. Um, thank you. I think, uh, sorry, just to add to that, I think it's also a great opportunity to look at um, collaborations that you probably may not have thought of before to weave that into your um, strategy and comms. Um, for example, um, I was recently working with a podcast called Women in Labor. And when um, this, you know, when the pandemic hit, the news shifted to the lockdown. Nobody really wanted to like talk about this really uplifting podcast. So we were like, okay, let's put the press outreach on pause for a while and think of how we can address the situation. And so then we reached out to photographers and artists to share their stories relevant to the home and that space um, on Women in Labour's Instagram. And that was a great audience building exercise. Yeah, I also think what's really nice is that in this circumstance, there are people who maybe would never have considered working with you before who now want to because things are different. So I think relook at opportunities that you may have you know, given up before and see how you can weave that into your communication right now. Um, even for disco, a lot of what we used to advertise were job opportunities or collaboration opportunities. And even if those don't exist at the moment, we're kind of seeing how to help people revamp their cover letters, revamp their CVs, talking about like people who are actively looking to collaborate, you know, help people along the journey. I'd say don't just pretend like the situation isn't happening, but also don't only talk about pandemic, 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 because that's a bit too much. So I think being creative, definitely um, something in between would be good. Our next question is from Sakshi Janeja. And she says, having run LBT offline spaces and events where human to human connection is so, so important, taking it online pretty much suffocates the very need. Also the question of how do you monetize the online space? We covered this, I think, um, but how do you monetize the online space when you're not anymore providing this basic need? And how do you encourage your brand partners to continue funding you in the digital space minus the in-person experience? I think that's quite important because I think for most of us who do offline events, sponsorship and having brand partners is critical, right? Like how do you convince them to keep supporting you um, going forward? And what do you do when that human to human connection is so important that you can't just take it out? Is there anyone who wants to take that question? I think maybe Malika, you might be a good person or Sarah as well. I was going to say with, with brand partnerships, I think it's, I think it's not a case of like, I think it's more a case of just having an open communication channel with um, partners that you've maybe worked with before who've helped you out financially. And rather than just, you know, when, when there seems to be, because everyone is kind of holding tight at the moment. No one really wants to spend any money. And if they do, it's very little. So I think it's also a case of just keeping that dialogue open and just letting them know what you're doing, what you want to do. And like when there's like um, synergy, then, then it will work out. But I think, um, uh, I think it's just really important to tell, to tell your previous partners what you're up to and just to keep um, a conversation and a communication um, channel open with them, which is not constantly like trying to find out like what do they want to spend on and like how, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, it shouldn't just constantly just be, um, asking them what they want to spend on and when it should be very much like trying to figure out where there's like a perfect fit and then that will like it or it will happen like or quite organically I think yeah I also think um you know keeping in mind that brands and sponsors will still need to sponsor things in the future it may not be the exact same thing but they will still want to market they'll still want to tap in, into your audience so if you have a strong relationship and you have a strong audience, then think about how they might want to sponsor what they'd like to sponsor in the future and, and think about those partnerships. Yeah. I think this also, if I may, Krisha, I think, I think this also ties in with what I was saying earlier, which is that people are looking right now to deliver more to their audiences uh, than ever before uh, virtually. So there are cross collaborations across industries that you're seeing. Uh, you know, we are being approached by banks and people that we've been talking to for 
or, or we've sort of been in conversation with for, for, for so many months who now want to offer their communities uh, an, an added value. And so I think that if, as long as you have the ability, I mean, the question is, uh, how do you do it and how do you monetize it? I think, you know, cross collaboration will happen because people are looking to offer more to their, uh, to their base, but also uh, in terms of monetizing it, that will happen if you have a demand and you believe in the service that you're providing. And if that service is truly delivering value and you focus on maintaining that value, uh, then I think that monetizing that will eventually, will eventually happen mm -hmm. because people will understand that value. And as a result, you'll sort of be able to offer it to many more people. So collaborate collaborations are, are critical and, and they're happening right now. And I think it's a really exciting time because we're, uh, even if you don't have those relationships, that you, as you had mentioned, um, if you're able to offer an, uh, you know, a following something that they never experienced before, uh, that's huge. Yeah, and I think we're really starting to see a need to really understand what does the word collaboration mean? You know, what does it really mean in practice? It's, it's a relationship, there's a give and a take. I think the one thing we keep telling people in our community is, you can't just sign up onto Disco and hope that collaborations will come. You know, you've got to look for people that you think are interesting, think about what they're doing, think about what you could do together. And if nothing's coming to you, you go to someone with an idea and say, hey, I think I could add value to you in this way. And this is what we're looking for. So I think thinking about that give and take and thinking about what value you can add is absolutely critical to, to cracking successful collaborations that can help you tide over the financial stress as well. Um, I think the next question is more for Archana or, you know, people who are working with stylists and photographers and other people who are, whose work is kind of very much offline. What do you see as the future for these freelancers or for these independent professionals? Um, how do you think their work lives are going to go forward? I know there are people doing things online like FaceTime photo shoots and you know they're hacking things right now but what do you think is the future for all of those independent freelancers whose work is um, based on physical interaction with people? Right so it, it is tough it is going to be complicated and complex actually so um, I think it is about you know again tying back to what I was saying earlier like to, to be able to create and innovate and think of like new ideas like you know um, I, I think it was one of the international books that started this entire at-home shoots, you know, and then everyone kind of got up on it. So, so again, it was just one idea that just went viral. So it's all about just coming up with these like, you know, constant ways of, as you all, all mentioned, like co-creating something. And you don't have to think of constantly completely pivoting whatever you're doing. You just have to think of evolving. So just take it kind of one step at a time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good answer. Is there anyone else that wants to talk about independent professionals or we can move on to the next question, um, which is around are many businesses looking at more sustainable business models or a more sustainable approach from localizing human resources or your entire cycle of offerings? I think that's really important right now. I could talk about it. So, I mean, from a uh, like planning a wedding perspective, 100%, right? Not just uh, because weddings are smaller, events are smaller, people don't want to be paying to bring stuff from outside or people from outside, but there are travel risks, there are health risks. And so we do actually think that a lot of small events, a lot of weddings as well, are going to rely more on local resources. Um, and what's going to be important though is figuring out how to position yourself as a resource that can be trusted, right? We think at this point, a lot of people are willing to pay a bit of a premium for safety, for knowing that, you know, the people coming into their house are safe, are taking care of themselves, the products coming in have been handled the right way. And so if you're a local vendor looking to increase your business, if you're able to prove that part out, I think there's actually quite a bit of opportunity. Thanks, Sana. Um, yeah, I think sustainability is definitely one topic that's on the top of most of the Disco community members' minds, you know, and I think this is a time when we're all reflecting and thinking we can stay lean, we can reduce so much, we can take away so much of the fluff. Um, some of it is, is just 
fun to have, but the rest of it definitely we're rethinking what elements can we trim down. And I think that is, um, at least in our perspective, the way of thinking we should be, we should all be looking at, you know, even those going beyond offline communities and offline gatherings, just being more mindful and sustainable in general. We have more questions, but I think we're running out of time. I'm going to include one more before we wrap up. Uh, do you think the migration of skilled talent back to their hometowns will now help the regional space evolve better? Or should the talent stay in bigger cities and try to sustain since the scope might gradually evolve post the pandemic? I can respond to that perhaps. Um, and I'll respond to that with an example. Um, I'm currently working with a wonderful gallery in Baroda, Gallery Arc. And um, one of the things that they always struggled with was um, that they couldn't really tap into the Bombay Delhi market, right? Now, this is a great opportunity to that, that geographical barrier gets removed, right? If everybody's buying online, um, then it's a tremendous equalizer. And I think it's the same with um, any other kind of work. You know, you, you could be a super talented content creator, web designer sitting in Jabalpur, but you could still have clients in Bombay and it doesn't matter. It does, you don't have to move to Bombay to be able to realize those big city dreams. So, yeah. And of course, there are communities like Disco that help that make that happen. So... We hope so. No, I think, I think you know, there, there's so much talent that's across the country right now and being, being online helps you work with them, you know, wherever they are. And that is something that we're so excited to do. There's a lot more possibility. Um, and I think on one, there's one note that I wanted to leave this on is that I think this is a nice opportunity for us to right any wrongs or at least try to right any wrongs that we think have existed within our respective industries you know, obviously not being able to tackle everything. But if we can think of one or two things that we think weren't being done well before, I feel like this little break and this window of opportunity is a good time to try and create a new way of doing things. And I just want to thank all of you here so much for being here. I, I've genuinely really enjoyed the discussion. We have at least 10 more questions that we haven't been able to get to, but I'm going to share those with you after. And I, we will try and get answers to those questions. Um, to the entire community here and all of our speakers, we really hope that you continue this dialogue going forward. You know, I mentioned it three times now, but we don't want this to end when this webinar comes to an end. And that's why we're pushing everyone to sign up onto Disco, where we're creating spaces for you to carry these conversations on. I know there's at least um, 50 or 60 people here who've asked to be connected to different people who've taken part in our events, the speakers, and they want to do stuff with you. So I really do encourage everyone to reach out. Don't see it as you're an audience member and these are the speakers. These are people I'm sure who would love to talk to you and hear about how you might want to work with them. And yes, thank you very, very much, everyone, for being here. And that was my first webinar. <laughs> thank you, Krisha. Thanks thank so much for having us. Thank yeah, thank you so much. And lovely thank to meet everyone. And Krisha, you did a fab job. Well done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone who signed in. Thank we you. will be in touch. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.